talking about the map of the autonomic nervous system. So Eric Wolterstorff, he took Peter Levine's map of the nervous system and turned it into this five states model map, uh, which is a 2D, much more functional version of the map, um, which we'll cover right now, okay? So before we get into the map, just a couple things on the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is not under our conscious control, right? So it's this part of us that kind of is running the show. You know, there's thousands of physiological things we have going on um, and it's kind of keeping it all running, right? So autonomic, think of automatic, right? And it's not under our conscious control. There are parts of it we can influence like our breathing, if we focus on our breath, we can have influence on certain areas of our ANS, but the majority of it is not under our conscious control. So that's an important part to kind of keep in mind, right? And it's a non-cognitive, non-verbal part of us, right? So um, most mammals share the same basic autonomic nervous system, right? So you don't need cognition to have this uh, nervous system working, right? Um, and the ANS governs many body processes, such as heart rate, breathing, metabolism, temperature, digestion, hormone levels, all sorts of things. Okay. And the nervous system, our autonomic nervous system, uh, influences many parts of our experience, right? Our physical sensations and impulses, our cognition, right? The quality and type of thoughts we're having, the pacing of our thoughts, our emotional states and moods uh, are a large part determined by our ANS states, our sense of self, right? Um, our sense of others, right? Can you trust others? How deeply can you connect and be with others? Do you feel safe around others? And our sense of the world, right? Is the universe a friendly place, right? And that question is answered typically from a bottom up uh, place rather than a top down, right? So our ANS uh, has a large say in our response to that, that question right? and the state of our ANS. So if any of you had a snack before the meeting, right? If you had some nuts or potato chips, uh, you, you eat it and then your body starts to release digestive enzymes, right? And all of that is happening at the level of the autonomic nervous system, right? And then your, your body, your pancreas releases insulin to balance your blood sugar, right? And that's all happening automatically, right? It's not under our conscious control, right? If I turn the lights off in the room we're in, our pupils would start to dilate, right? Or if I made it super bright, they would start to constrict. And again, we don't have conscious control over that. It would just happen, right? And that's part of the autonomic nervous system, right? If, or if we all went for a run, right? And it was hot enough outside, eventually we'd start to sweat. And that's our autonomic nervous system trying to keep us in this homeostatic place, right? Or the same thing with shivering. If it got really cold, uh, we would start to shiver. And again, that wouldn't, you, you couldn't choose not to sweat or shiver if it was hot enough or cold enough, right? It's the autonomic nervous system, this non-cognitive, non-verbal part of us that, that's kind of running the show, okay? Um, so this is a key point that I wrote up here. ANS is not under our conscious control, okay? And that's a good thing because it, it helps keep everything functioning, right? If we had to think about the thousands of things our body is doing, uh, that's kind of all we would do. And we, we wouldn't be able to do anything else, right? So it's running the show. It's keeping all these thousands of things uh, going and functioning, okay? So I drew two lines here. There's a vertical line right here with the word activation, okay? And at the, this point, it means there's no activation, right? So you're in a calm, neutral, alert place, your autonomic nervous system, your body, right? It's at a state zero, calm, neutral, alert, awake, right? As we move up on this line, the body and the nervous system gets more and more activated, right? So down here, it's mildly activated. Way up here, it's peak activation, maximum activation. That means the autonomic nervous system is um, at its most level of activation, right? So right now the door opened, right? We would all kind of orient towards the door, that's a little bit of an activation, right? You're in, it's an orienting response. You're turning to look, right? You're asking, your autonomic nervous system is saying, what is it? Is it safe? Is it dangerous, right? So there's a little bit of activation, right? Um, 
But say we, we turned and it was a huge hungry bear, our system would get very highly activated, right? So this, this vertical line is activation, okay? Now I drew this horizontal line and this, it, this line is the threat level, okay? So at zero it means there's no threat in our environment. Uh, so we're safe, there's no danger. Um, and as we move right on this line, the threat level increases, right? So uh, way, way over here would be a, a severe threat, like a lion a foot away from us that's chasing us, uh, hasn't had food in days, right? So significant, severe threat, no threat, okay? So let's use an example. Um, so let's say you're walking home from work one day, right? Just your normal route. And it's uh, winter time, so it gets dark a little early. You're walking down a street to your apartment, and you kind of hear footsteps behind you, right? Uh, your system might get a little bit, uh, start to perceive maybe there's danger behind me, right? And in response to that, it activates a little to deal with the threat, okay? Or let's use another example. Say you're driving home from work in the winter time, and you're listening to music, right? You're in a calm, neutral place state zero, and all of a sudden you hit some black ice, right? All of a sudden a threat shows up and your system responds with the appropriate amount of activation to deal with that threat, right? You grip the real wheel, your legs do what they need to do to get the car out of that black ice, right? So what that looks like on the map, Okay, so I'm gonna use uh, for this example, for to represent our autonomic nervous system, I want you to imagine this black dot is a weighted marble. Okay, so it's a weighted marble. So it's got weight to it. So it wants to move downwards. Um, so let's say you're, you're driving home, you're in a calm neutral place, state zero, um, the ventral vagal place in the nervous system. And then you hit the black ice, right? So a threat shows up and your body activates to deal with the threat, right? So you've got tension, adrenaline, you get focused, your vision. And let's say you get out of the ice and you make it home and you're safe and sound, right? So what happens? There's no more threat, right? Because you made it out, you, you're safe, you're in a comfortable place. So your body says, oh, we don't have to stay at this level of activation because it's biologically taxing to, to stay up here and there's no threat. So the marble comes back down to state zero. So it gradually returns to a calm, neutral place once there's no more threat and you're safe, okay? So another example, just, just to give, give more examples, is say you probably had the experience, you're walking down the street, talking on the phone, and you hit the curb, right? So you're walking and talking in state zero, and you hit the curb with your foot or something, and you're about to fall. So the th a threat shows up of, of getting hurt and your body activates to deal with the threat in the same way, right? And it tenses up your calf, your hamstrings, certain muscles so you don't fall on your face, right? If you had to consciously say, left hamstring, tighten up 67%, right calf, do this, right? You would fall every time, right? But the autonomic nervous system, which is not under your conscious control, responds to deal with the threat, right? So it's an adaptive response to deal with the threat. Okay, so you don't fall, you, you collect yourself and then you calm back down, right? Your system returns to state zero. So that marble returns to state zero. Okay, so now let's, I'm gonna switch the example. So let's say you live in New York City, right? And every couple months uh, you, you say, I gotta get out of the city uh, and you go camping, right? You've been doing this for years. You, you find a place in the Adirondacks and you set up a little tent for the weekend and you just read books and have a good time and, and kind of de-stress. Uh, so it's that time of year, you go to your campsite, you set up your tent, you're reading a, a nice book you enjoy, you're in state zero, calm, neutral, alert, you're just enjoying a book in your tent, right? Let's say after a couple hours you're reading and you hear really loud noise outside, right? Scary loud branch breaks or something, right? All of a sudden, your system's gonna get activated because all of a sudden it's saying, what is that, right? Is it a dangerous bear or is it just the leaves and the wind, right? So 
you're going to peek out of the tent, right? And your system gets activated. Your heart's going to increase. Your muscles are going to get a little tense. And let's say it just was the wind that knocked over a tree, right? You, then you're going to go back into your tent and say, oh, it was just the wind, right? And the, the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, the body is going to return to state zero gradually. So the adrenaline is going to release. Your heart rate is going to go back to normal. Um, and you're going to be nice and calm. But let's say it wasn't just the wind. Let's say it was a bear, right? A big, dangerous looking bear, right? So you're not going to return to state zero because there's an active threat, right? It's not in your striking perimeter, meaning it's not close enough to attack you right away, but it's like 100 feet away, right? So you peek out of the tent, you see this big bear, right? Um, so at this point, what's going to happen is because because this bear could be outside your tent all weekend or for hours, your system isn't going to return to state zero, right? What, what's happened is we have these built-in attractor states or troughs that are built into the nervous system. And they're, it kind of looks like this. So what's going to happen is that bear is roaming around your tent and your system is going to go sit in this trough, okay? So if you notice, this place is a little more activated than state zero, right? So you're not going back to a calm, neutral, relaxed place. You're going to be in a, in a mild stress state because there's a, there's a danger, right? Uh, even though it's not, again, within your striking perimeter, it's uh, close enough to possibly be a danger, right? So this bear is wandering around. So we call this state one or mild stress. Okay, so state one, mild stress. And your system can stay here for a lifetime, right? If it, if it perceives the threat, um, just like the bear could stalk, be out there all weekend, just wandering about, your system's never gonna return to state zero because it's not gonna feel safe enough to do that, right? And state one is an adaptive state, okay? It's, it's good we have this, right? Because if there were two people, one in state zero and one in state one, and the bear did attack, the one in state one's gonna make it out because it's already activated, ready to go, right? And it can get high, more activated quicker than the person in state zero. So the person in state zero is gonna be the bear's lunch or dinner, right? Um, so there's, a, there's an adaptive mechanism for why we have these troughs. It's to keep us on guard or ready for action to fight or flight in case the threat increases, okay? So what are the symptoms of state one? State one, mild stress, okay? The symptoms, um, or more appropriately and accurately, the adaptive autonomic nervous system responses include increased heart rate and breath speed, somatic tension, tight muscles, headache, other pain, sensations of heat, tight jaw, headaches, itchiness, increased energy, hyper alertness, speedy thoughts, irritability, annoyance, excitement, fear, anxiety, anger, feeling nervous, difficulty sleeping, restlessness or feeling fidgety, right? So somebody in state one is going to have a harder time falling asleep because their system's saying, wait, we're not going to sleep if there's a, there's a bear wandering about our tent, right? So these symptoms or uh, adaptive responses are uh, part of state one, right? And somebody can have some of them, a lot of them, um, but they were at the, the key thing about this is at one point there were adaptive responses to a threat, right? So they made sense at some point. Okay, so let's return to our example. So let's say uh, after a couple hours, uh, you, you're like, what do I do? There's this bear out there, you're in mild stress, right? You got anxiety, you got fear, you're nervous. Um, let's say the bear sees you, right? And says, oh, there's my dinner, right? And he starts running at your tent, right? Big, hungry, dangerous looking bear is coming at your tent, right? You're not gonna stay in mild stress because it's no longer mild stress, right? The threat level's increasing. We have a bear running at us. So what happens now is we move up on the nervous system map, okay? The body, the autonomic nervous system responds to the threat by going to a higher state of activation, right? You see how this is much higher? Um, 
So in a moment, we would decide, are we going to fight or flight, right? And again, this isn't a, a top-down thought process. Your nervous system is going to say fight or flight, and it's going to have a, a response, right? And it's going to activate. So let's say this example, we, we see the bear, and we're like, oh my gosh, that's a huge bear, and we just run to our pickup truck, right? So now our nervous system moves from mild stress up to state two, which we call high stress. So this is all out fight or flight, and in this case, flight. So we're running for our life, literally, right? So state two, high stress, okay? So this is all out fight or flight, right? So we're running to our pickup truck for, the, for our lives, right? So everything's working at optimal maximum performance, right? So instead of anger, we have rage. Instead of fear, we have terror, right? Instead of nervousness, we have panic, right? Instead of moderate tension, we have severe muscle tensions, right? Our breathing, our heart rate goes even higher, right? So it's state one on steroids, right? So it's maximum activation, high stress, okay? And the adaptive responses of state two or the symptoms of state two are, here are some of them, panic, Overall body tension, muscles contracting, heart racing, sweating, shaking, trembling, rage, terror, hyperventilation, maximum performance, very fast thoughts, and doesn't last very long. Okay, so when you go into high stress, notice how state one is this trough that the marble can just sit in, the autonomic nervous system can just sit there, right? If I had a three-dimensional version of this map and I put a marble there, it would just sit, it could just sit in state one, it could sit in state zero forever, right? But state two is a semi-stable state. The marble can't sit there. The reason is it's because it's such a highly activated state, the body runs out of biological energy, right? So it can't last long. So it stays there for minutes at the most. Okay. So let's say you're running all out to your pickup truck, right? Um, and you get to your truck, you go to open the door and you realize, oh no, I left my keys in, in the tent, right? So uh, you do a little loop-de-loop -loop and you run back to your, your tent and the bear is still chasing you, but now you go to your tent and the bear is coming in through the front, right? So uh, all of a sudden there's no active way to escape. Right, you're, you're in the tent, the bear's coming in, right? So at some point you're gonna hit, if the threat continues and it increases, you're gonna hit overwhelm, right? So your active defensive responses didn't work, right? So at some point you're gonna hit overwhelm. Okay. And so say you're in the tent and now the bear's coming and there's no way to escape right? Your system is going to have a massive parasympathetic response. So up until now, this is the sympathetic uh, nervous system, right? It's the gas pedal, right? So there's a threat. We're, we're engaging the gas to deal with the threat, the accelerator pedal, right? That's why I used a red marker because this is stress, right? At the point of overwhelm, uh, our parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, right? It's the gas pedal, right? So uh, the way, a way to think about it is, um, think about is a car that has the gas all the way down and the brake, it's just sitting there, but it's revving, right? Or imagine a heavy wool blanket that just goes over somebody in state two, right? So you're in the tent, you realize, oh no, there's no way out, this bear is coming in through the front and your, your body engages a massive parasympathetic response and it's like a heavy wool blanket that just goes over state two, right? And it looks like this on the map. So uh, another metaphor is a spring. So state zero, as you move up the map to state two, the, imagine the spring is just going up and down, up and down, up and down. You hit overwhelm, your system's like, I'm not gonna make it. Boom, this big blanket covers the spring, right? So it's a tight bound up spring ready to explode, but it's covered by this heavy wool blanket, right? So what happens is you play dead, right? You collapse, your system, goes into state three, which is called moderate trauma. 
state three. Okay. So you uh, collapse, you appear dead to the bear. Okay. So why does our, why do mammalian nervous systems have the state three in it? Right. So in nature for aggression to continue, you need resistance, right? So without the resistance, it's, it's harder for an animal to kill its prey and then eat its prey, right? So the idea is we drop the resistance, there's a chance uh, the animal might not continue to aggress, kill and eat us, right? So, um, and why do, why do predators like prey that resist them? Because it tells them it, it's, it's recently living, right? Because prey that's been dead for a while could have bacteria or parasites, right? So they don't want to eat that because that would jeopardize their, their life, right? So they want prey that resists. So the idea is we drop the resistance, maybe the predator will uh, stop aggressing and continue. So it's a last ditch effort. The body is saying, I tried everything. Let me try this last ditch thing of collapsing as a way to deal with this threat, okay? So it goes into state three, um, okay? So let's say you're in the tent, you're lying there, this bear is coming in, you're, you're collapsed, you're in this moderate trauma response, right? What are the symptoms you're gonna have in state three? So these adaptive responses include lessening muscle tension, collapsed postures, sensations of heavy weight, feeling cold, heaviness, nausea, lethargy, sleepiness, fogginess, confusion, Right, so things are gonna get confusing, slow thoughts, hopelessness, um, and, and this is the state of suicidality, okay? So, um, yeah, if you had hope, you would, you would be in states zero, one, or two, right? So state three is you're hoping for a passive response, right? Only if the bear doesn't continue to aggress or only if he gets distracted will I make it out, right? So it's a passive response. Right, you're only if, if only this thing happens, right? Um, your body gets really heavy, right? Fogginess, con confusion, right? Because imagine this blanket just sitting on this spring, this loaded spring, right? And, and keeping you down as a way to keep you alive, right? Um, so a key thing with state three, moderate trauma, is state one and two symptoms either alternate with these or occur simultaneously, right? So remember the brake and the pedal, the gas pedal and the brake are pressed, right? So you can have state one and two running, right? Just in case the bear gets distracted, the brake pedal can lift off and you can bail out of there, right? So, so there's a reason it's a dual activated state, right? So this is when people report anxiety and depression, right? And suicidality tends to show up in state three because um, it's hopeless, right? I, I might as well kill myself, right? Uh, Right? And those are cognitive processes that are coming up from these bottom-up states from the nervous system, okay? So state three moderate trauma is a dual activated state. So imagine the wool blanket over the spring, right? The spring that was going crazy at one point that just condenses, right? Um, okay, so state three moderate trauma. So we're in the tent, we're in state three, right? Um, and let's say now, five, his, his whole family comes in, six other bears walk in, right? So now there's no chance that he's gonna get distracted or the whole family's gonna get distracted, right? So what happens at this point, once our system says, oh, there's no solution, right? So now even this passive solution of playing dead or being in a complete collapse, uh, dorsal vagal response isn't working. So uh, there's no hope, right? So what happens now is our, ANS or body. Moves into state four, severe trauma. Okay. Okay, so what happens at this point is um once, the, once his whole family of bears come in and our system says, there's, there's no hope, right? There's no solution. That's the key. There's no solution here. Even if one or two bears get distracted, I'm still dinner, right? 
So at this point, uh, the parasympathetic engages even more, and it does this by releasing endorphins, right? So once you hit overwhelm, your body starts to flood your system with natural uh, endogenous opiates, right? And these are the painkillers, right? So you start, that's what kind of gives you that numb feeling, right? From state three to state four, the, the floodgates open. So you just get this rush of opiate numbing, right? So it's, it's nature's last gift. If you're going to die, you're not going to feel anything, right? So the bear could be eating your foot and you wouldn't be feeling it because it's, it's your system's flooding your system with these uh, dissociative uh, block, uh, pain blocking opiates, right? So this line right here where I broke, I, I did the little sever there, that just means there's no solution. Right, so state four is the state, it's, it is the solution. So state four is the solution because there was no solution. So remember state three, you had a weak solution, a weak passive, if only the bear gets distracted, if only he doesn't eat me because I'm, he thinks I'm dead for a while, right? But state four is no solution, right? So the system says there's no hope, uh, I'm better off disconnecting, right? And this is where people report out of body experiences, um, seeing themselves in the corner of the room. Um, and let me just share that some of the symptoms of state four, severe trauma, numbness, blank affect, right? Uh, lights are on, nobody's home, spaciness, right? Your whole body feels floaty, spacey, vision changes, right? So cloudy or tunnel vision, right? So if clients sometimes are sitting there and their, and their vision gets cloudy, tunnely, distorted, Right? or if yours does while you're in their presence, uh, feeling disconnected, feelings of unreality, out-of-body experience, complete dissociation. And state four is kind of a respite, right? Um, because the, the distinction between state four and state three is there's no solution, but there's also the absence of state one and two symptoms. So remember, state three was the gas pedal and the brake fully engaged, um, state four, you don't have that anymore. You don't have the, the gas pedal, right? It's just uh, complete dissociation. It's a complete parasympathetic response. Okay, so let's, um, yeah, let's just for this example, use this miraculous hypothetical uh, thing happens. There's, there's this army training unit flying above. They see the bears and they shoot them down, right? So what happens all of a sudden is there's no more threat. And let's say they land and they make sure you're safe and comfortable and you're out of danger, right? So what happens? There's no more threat and you've achieved safety, right? So this is, this is a key point too. So this, this is, okay. So what happens now is when, you've, uh, when the threat has, has been removed and you've achieved safety, the nervous system can, uh, it's not, it doesn't wanna stay in those states because those are much more activated states than being at state zero. So what happens is the nervous system wants to return to state zero, right? It wants to return to a ventral vagal place, right? But you don't beeline it. You don't just go from four to zero, right? What you do is your body has to return to state zero the way it came, right? So what that looks like is your system, your autonomic nervous system, again, which is not under your conscious control, will go from a state of not feeling, right, to a state of feeling heavy, depressed, right? This is when clients say like, oh, every day is like walking through a thick layer of mud. Everything's just really heavy, right? It's that collapse response, right? So you're going to go from feeling disconnected to feeling heavy, hopeless, depressed, right? So this movement can actually feel worse for people right? Because you're going from being totally disconnected to a place of heaviness, sadness. Um, people in state four typically aren't suicidal. They don't care, right? They're, they're kind of indifferent if they live or die, right? But people in state three is when they can be suicidal, right? Because that's like, oh, I'm feeling so heavy and tired. And what's the point? There's no hope, right? I have to wait for some passive thing to happen, right? And then the system goes from three to two, Right? But notice this, it has to go over this huge hump, right? And it moves from a state of collapse into a high energy state, right? So this is panic. So people can have panic attacks on your couch, right? And it's not necessarily they're having a, a, a negative experience. It's, it, if the solution and safety is in place, 
They could be returning from three to two, right? So they go from collapsed. So imagine the wool blanket coming off and now they're just left with the gas pedal. So they're feeling all the, the energy of state two. And that doesn't last long, right? It's because it's a semi-stable state. The body just doesn't have the energy to sustain that, right? So then it goes from two to one, back to mild stress. And then here's another key part of the map, right? From one to zero, the body, the nervous system has to go over this hump and go back to zero. So symptoms get worse before they get better. So people have more anxiety, more fear, more anger, more body tension, more uh, of the state one symptoms, they increase, and then they gradually go back to state zero. Okay, so that is the nervous system map. Okay, and we're gonna talk about uh, healing and what that looks like. Uh, I just do wanna add, there is, there's a side of the map on this side, on the, on the safety side, okay? And that involves uh, mobilized safety, right? Play, um, excitement, that isn't, there's no danger. So it's a safe, mobilized safety, which is like play. And then immobilized safety, which is intimacy, where you can really go into a parasympathetic response in a safe environment, right? But, uh, but for the purposes of stress and trauma, uh, this, this is what we need to know, these five states, state zero, one, two, three, four, okay? And the stable states are state zero, one, three, and four. Right, so people can live in those states for long periods of time. So here is the map. Relaxed and alert, state zero, stressed, high stress, moderate trauma, severe trauma. Okay, so now I'm going to show you guys some videos of animals. So we'll watch the video and then I'll talk about it on the map and kind of uh, it'll kind of help you understand uh, the map a little bit better. So we can use mammals, again, remember, mammals share the same basic autonomic nervous system as us, right? So um, let's start with the first video. So just make sure you have your volume up on your side. A young by keeping herself fed. Generally, a female with cubs must hunt four to five times more than another. Between shrubs where the fire flame crimson. The cheetah slinks by, stalking a more substantial prey. A group of impalas have found refuge in the shrubs, whose flamboyant colors merge with their tawny coat. Luma advances, trying to pick up her victim. Last, she dashes forward. This time, Luma has killed a good-sized female impala. Unfortunately, in the savannah, one's own gratification often stimulates another's envy. Luma's clutch, which had been observed from start to finish, has not left Mama Kingua, the spotted hyena, indifferent. He knows that Luma is completely extenuated by her final sprint. Yet, Things may not finish as we thought they would, but sometimes the weak are capable of cunning dissimulation. What did we see, right? So the gazelle is hanging out in state zero, eating grass, having a good time in the Sahara. The cheetah shows up, right? Um, and the gazelle moves into state one, ears pop up, right? There's a danger, it's not within, it's striking perimeter, right? So it doesn't have to uh, go into state two yet, but it's, it's uh, a danger, right? So it stays in state one. Eventually the cheetah attacks, right? So the threat level is increasing. So the activation of the nervous system increases, right? So the Gazelle goes into state two. And did you see how fast it was running? The camera guy couldn't even keep up, right? And so the gazelle's in state two and eventually it's chicking, it's running, it's trying everything. And his systems at some point says, we're not gonna make it, 
right? So it hits overwhelm. The cheetah's faster, stronger, quicker, right? And so once it hits overwhelm, it gets this massive parasympathetic response, the big wool blanket, boom, right? So did you see how stiff its arms were, right? It looked completely dead, right? And then the cheetah was exhausted from the chase um, and the hyena distracted it. And what happened? All of a sudden that the, the gazelle saw a way out, right? And boom, the blanket popped off. It bounced back into state two and it booked it out of there, right? So that's how state three was an adaptive response to the threat. It kept it alive, right? If the, if the gazelle just kept kicking and fighting, the, the cheetah would have uh, continued to uh, be aggressive and kill it, right? But because it went into that collapse response, it helped keep it alive. This is an Arctic fox, okay? Yeah, notice how it reconnects with its, its tribe, right? Yeah, so what happened there? Uh, Arctic fox was walking around in, in his homeland, uh, state zero, calm, neutral, alert, and then he got caught in a trap, right? So his system went through this, right? Uh, so he, he, you, you don't just, you can't just beeline it to state three or four. You got to go through this way as well, right? So it's system at some pace and it can do it in an instant of a second or it could do it in a couple of seconds, right? Probably tried kicking and getting out of there, right? And state two, right? Kept kicking and at some point he realized I can't get out of it, right? So collapse, state three, moderate trauma. And it could have been in state three for days. Who knows how long it was until the hunter came, right? So systems just staying in state three. If only I can get out of this. Right? Or if only you know, someone lets me out or something, right? Um, and then what happens? The hunter thought he was dead, literally. That's why he took him off the thing and threw him in a box. And then the, the Arctic fox's system, its nervous system said, there's a way out. Boom, pops out of three into two and runs. Um, and then socially re-engages with his tribe, right? So another example of how state three, the moderate trauma response, was an adaptive response that helped it survive. So this is an Impala.
and the Impala was overwhelmed, right? State three, uh, a deep state three, right? And then when the uh, predator got distracted and ran off, chased off, its system started to slowly come out of a deep state three, right? Did you see the breathing kind of return? And then it was in this dual activated state where it still collapsed, but started to tremble, right? That's the lighter part of state three, the dual activated. Um, and then eventually it came out of state three and popped up to state two and, and got out of there, right? And then eventually when it achieves more safety and you know, back in a safer place, the system will kind of return fully, right? And that's where they do more trembling and shaking. This tactic is of little use, especially since the opossum can't run fast enough to hide very far away. Just as the second coyote senses that a meal is at hand, her mate appears to have lost his appetite. Most predators need the stimulation of resistance to incite them to kill, and the act of killing to induce them to eat. An inert body inspires little interest. The possum is still breathing, and in fact, it's only playing dead, playing possum. Waiting time until the threat of danger is past. It's not just consciously putting on a good act, however. It actually goes into a state similar to shock, a condition known as thanatosis. <laughs> The coyotes are fooled into searching for livelier prey. While gradually, as it senses that the coast is clear, the opossum comes out of its trance and goes about its steady, deliberate way. So there we saw state four. Okay, so the opossum uh, is hanging out. The fox comes, attacks it. And it, there's a key thing here to notice. So did you notice how quickly the possum got overwhelmed? So remember the gazelle and how it ran for a while in state two, right? But the, the possum was quickly overwhelmed. So it just fought a little bit and then boom, went into state three, right? So this is an example of the difference between, typically, um, between children and adults, right? As adults, we're more like the gazelle. We, we're stronger, we can leave, we can fight back, we can ask for help right? Um, children can't do a lot of that, right? They can't leave family, right? Um, so they're more like the possum. They get overwhelmed easier and go into states three and four, especially if the a threat's coming within the family, right? Because there's, there's nowhere to run, uh, and typically they're much smaller, so they can't fight back. Um, so that's just an example of the difference, uh, and that depends on your ability. Uh, there's a term called motility, and that's the ability to conceive of possible solutions, right? So adults have more motility generally. They can conceive of ways out uh, easier than children, right? So they asked a bunch of four-year-olds why the sun comes up in the morning. And a typical response was, so dad can go to work, right? So um, the child's consciousness is very different. Their ability to conceive of possible solutions to threats is much smaller than adults. So they get overwhelmed much more easier like the, the possum, right? So the possum was in state three, then the second fox showed up and the system's like, oh, I'm done, right? And it goes into state four, right? Complete dissociation, right? It looked dead, it was just lying there. And then the foxes uh, didn't eat it because it, it looked dead um, and they didn't know if it was dead for an hour or days, right? And then once they disappeared, his, his system started to move out of four into three. Um, and then you saw it kind of moving so slowly, he was still in state three, 
right? When he was walking away, but it was that slow movement, right? And then once he gets deeper into safety and, and more out of danger, his system will go over that big hump back to one and then over one to zero, right? But state four showed up there. It's that complete dissociation, right? And then his system moved back into three and that's when he was walking really slowly and, and kind of uh, seeking more safety. Okay, this is a polar bear. We're These the pads there are sort of like uh, like non-skid material, and it's all sort of rough. It's not really smooth. It helps them get uh, better traction on the ice. That's right. That's almost like a sandpaper. And then, of course, big claws for ripping, breaking in the seal layers. But he hasn't started to really chip his teeth. You watch that animal after he finishes convulsing, you'll see because he's aware of the fact that we're all around him, and it's a very stressful experience for an animal like the polar bear. And after he settles down, and then he'll start doing a couple of deep breaths, and then he'll breathe really nicely. And I go, here he goes. See how he's breathing now? Even though it looks a little unpleasant, it looks like he's it lets off all that stress and, and he then is able to relax and, and uh, sleep the thing off. Polar bear was hanging out uh, in the ice cap, state zero. Big, large mechanical insect appears, right? And polar bears are typically not prey. They're typically the predators. Big, scary, loud mechanical insect shows up. Uh, he starts running. And if you notice, he was biting over his shoulder at the helicopter, right? So high stress, uh, complete all out flight. Um, and then they dart him. Right, and he hits overwhelm. Right, so the dart's like uh, an induced state three or four response. Right, and then the mechanical insect lands and disappears. Right, so the threat essentially was gone. Right, and human beings aren't a threat to a polar bear. It's like having kitty cats around us. Our system doesn't register those cats as a threat. So the the humans were not a threat to the polar bear, and they weren't hurting him. Right. So system said, oh, the threat's gone, the big mechanical insect's gone. And as the drug wore off, you saw a system come out of three, go into two, and then he went into, went over two, and then went into one, and then went over that hump where it was shaking, and then he returned to a calm place where he was just breathing normally and nice and calmly, okay? So system released the stress from the chase, right? That, uh, that part of his system that got overwhelmed. Okay, so um, I want to give you guys another metaphor for the map. Okay, so I want you to imagine a puzzle, you know, those 500 piece puzzles that you can make. And let's say it's state zero, the puzzle's completely put together. So you can see the complete image, you know, oh, it's a beautiful ship in the ocean, right? So that's state zero. As you move from state zero to one, imagine all four sides of the puzzle start getting pushed in, right? So the puzzle pieces now are kind of stressed and pushing into each other and there's more tension, right? But the image is still, you can still make out the complete image, right? You can still see the boat and the ocean and whatever uh, the puzzle is showing you. Then we move into state two, high stress. So now imagine 
a lot more pressure on the sides of the puzzle. So the pieces now are kind of pushing on the brim. They're kind of going to uh, maybe explode or separate, but the image is still completely uh, understandable, right? So you can see the image and still make out the ship and everything. So there's still congruence. Once you hit overwhelm, I want you to imagine the puzzle pieces splitting off, right? Fragmenting. So that's when the psyche fragments, right? So all of a sudden, uh, the image isn't clear, right? Um, the memory isn't clear anymore, right? So people have fragments of memories at this point, right? Um, and the opiate system can, can block some parts of the memories from uh, solidifying completely, right? So the puzzle image kind of splits up uh, more and more as you go deeper into uh, trauma responses, right? Um, and as we kind of come back, the puzzle pieces kind of return and, and go through the map on the way back. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to just give you that uh, because it's important to remember that people who've just experienced high stress, they have usually good recall of the memories, right? Um, so it's still a complete like, oh, I can remember everything that happened, right? Uh, once we hit overwhelm and hit it, go into a trauma response, the, the image kind of splits up. So people just have fragments here and there. And that can appear as just sensation sometimes or thoughts or images or, or certain uh, pieces of the, the puzzle, right? But it's not a complete congruent thing. Okay. This is just showing the way back, right? We got to come back the way we went, right? And if we, we only went into a state three, as some of the animals do, uh, then we just return from state three, right? If we just had a high stress response or a mild stress response to something, uh, we just return from that state, right? So if you had a minor fender bender that was a little bit stressful, uh, but there was no overwhelm, there wasn't high stress, uh, your system's gonna just have a state one place in it that is gonna return from one to zero, right? So you don't necessarily have to go all the way to four. Up until the overwhelm point, we're just talking about stress, okay? I use the red marker for a reason, because these are called hot states. So you actually get hot, they're hot symptoms, anxiety, anger, rage, tension, annoyance, irritability, right? Hot, red. These state three and four are cold states, right? That's why I use the blue marker. So you actually, people report feeling cold and that has to do with blood flow changes. Um, so people get heavy and cold, right? So cold states, cold symptoms, hot states, hot symptoms. This is trauma responses, stress response. What are the differences between stress and trauma? So stress is state one and two, right? Trauma is state three and four. And these are responses from the autonomic nervous system, which again is not under our conscious control. Stress is sympathetic nervous system. Trauma is parasympathetic or the dorsal vagal system, okay? Stress involves hot symptoms. Trauma is cold symptoms or dual activated, right? So it's hot covered by the cold. Stress is the psyche's way of saying, this is a lot, I must hold on, right? Trauma is psyche's way of saying, this is too much, I give up. Stress, active fight or flight defensive responses worked in stress. There was a solution, right? You made it to your pickup truck, you opened the, you opened the door, got in, got away, right? Trauma, the need for passive dissociate, dissociative parasympathetic uh, defense and trauma, weak or no solution, right? I'm gonna play dead and maybe the animal will get distracted, right? Trauma involves a, a violation of no, right? So you're overwhelmed, your boundaries have been breached. Stress, defenses are still active, right? So the fighting or fleeing worked, right? You, you, you didn't go past the overwhelm point. And trauma, the body starts to shut down. So containment is an intervention, um, it was also a contribution from Eric Wolterstorff. Um, and basically it's a, it's a way to amplify the system to help facilitate it moving back on the nervous system map, right? So when we, the conditions are set up, right? When the support is in place, meaning safety, the initial conditions of safety, a solution for the threat, right? Um, then we can contain and wait as the system moves back on the nervous system map, okay? Um, and it will move back. It's like a fishing rod. Once solutions in place, 
Imagine a fishing rod that just starts to pull the marble back, right? Um, and as long as we don't discharge, right, we contain the discharges, the person's system will move back. So humans, we have um, one, we don't understand this mechanisms. And, and the other thing is we have these big frontal lobes, right? So we're all, always making meaning out of things and stories. Um, and so let's say you go home one day after work, you're sitting on your couch and you start to feel anxiety building, right? Your stomach's getting tight, your heart rate's increasing, you start, your thoughts start increasing its pacing. Uh, what do most people do? They'll get up and do something, eat, eat a bunch of bonbons, go for a run, call a friend, right? Um, so we interrupt the, the, the process that's starting to happen, right? And it's precisely, and it's counterintuitive, but it's precisely because we're safe and in a calm place that the nervous system is saying, okay, let's release the, the stress that's sitting, sitting in state one, right? So we start to get activated. But we misinterpret what's happening uh, because it feels worse before it feels better, right? So we go do distractions or resources, right? And that kind of beelines us to state zero, but it doesn't process the stress, okay? So what happens is because we have these big frontal lobes, we misinterpret what's happening. One, because we don't really know about this map. And two, because it feels worse before it feels better, right? So containment is about containing the ways we discharge, right? So if you notice when people talk about stress or traumatic events, uh, they'll, they'll fidget, they'll move, they'll kind of go glassy eyed. So those are discharges, right? So the system's saying, oh, we're going back to zero, right? But it's feeling worse. I'm getting anxious. I'm going to take three deep breaths or I'm going to do this jerky thing with my neck or whatever. There's, there's a bunch of different mechanisms and discharges people have. So containment's just an intervention. We're just saying, let's contain those discharges. So instead of doing those three deep breaths, let's just see what happens if we don't give into that impulse, right? And so it's like, imagine a dam with a bunch of leaks and we're plugging the holes in the dam to see what happens when the, all the holes are plugged. And what happens is the nervous system starts to move on the map as long as there's a solution in place. So containment is reassociation of a client to their own experience through inhibiting coping, discharge, or escape mechanisms. Um, so initial conditions, which are very important, are present, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And that containment is an event memory process, not a semantic memory process. So we don't need interpretation. We don't need to say, oh, that was you pushing against the bear, right? We just notice the arms moving, or we notice the heat in the body, or we notice the collapse. Um, and another key point is containment is not stillness, okay? So this is a key thing to communicate to clients. Um, we're not asking you to be still. We're just, we, don't, we want you to inhibit voluntary movement to allow for involuntary movement, okay? Um, and, and I have these little dials on the right in that image because containment isn't an on-off switch. It's a dial. We can increase the amount of containment, meaning we can contain more and more and more, or we can just do a, a light containment. Um, and we'll talk about when you want to tighten up the contain, containment intervention or when you kind of want to uh, allow it to be a little more loose. That is a brief summary of the map of the five states of the autonomic nervous system. If you're a clinician or practitioner and would like to be trained in this modality, feel free to reach out to me directly at my email shown here to find out more information about our trainings. If you'd like to receive treatment in this modality, feel free to reach out via email as well, and we will find you a local practitioner trained in this specific modality or someone who could work with you remotely. Thank you.